I'm Debbie Schwartz, founder of Rhodes College and um, the College Insights Academy program, which some of you are part of. And I'm here tonight with Alan Whalen, who, um, again, a lot of you know if you are part of the College Insights Academy program. And we also have a guest tonight, Jennifer McCrickard, um, who is a professor of philosophy at Drake University and is going to talk to us about helping students transition from high school to college. And she has a lot of um, a lot of great insights, being a professor, having worked with students. And, um, you know, I, we, we were talking before, I didn't even mention, of course, I mean, I have kids that are in college, but I know that this information could help them probably at any point. Because yes. uh, <laughs> they still have many years left in college. They're at the, only at the beginning. So, um, so how about um, Jennifer, do you want to just um, give a little background or, or about yourself and yeah, then absolutely. get started? Um, let's see, what is there to sh uh, in a snapshot? I live in Des Moines, Iowa, where I teach at Drake University. I just stepped down from being honors uh, director of the honors program for about 10 years there. Um, I say that I'm trained in philosophy because I have a PhD in, in philosophy, but what I really love is teaching. And I love students and I love helping students to figure out what they want to do and to make college the best experience it can be for them in terms of really paying off down the road. So that's what I love. That's who I am. And I've got two dogs. <laughs> and I've got pictures of them in my PowerPoint presentation. So you stick around for the dogs. Great. Well, um, do you want to get started? I mean, Absolutely. I think we've got um, a good number of people that are here and, and people are continuing to trickle in. So I think, you know, be worth, if you want to um, Absolutely. start. Absolutely. I'll share my PowerPoint. Um, let's see. Let's put this into slideshow. I don't want to do better presentations. I just want to play from the start. There we go. All right. Um, this is a relatively, not relatively, I'm just going to flat out, this is a long PowerPoint presentation. I have no expectation that I'm going to get through the whole thing. I just would prefer to have too many slides um, and not need them than have too few slides and have there be dead air. Um, so and, I will- And sorry to interrupt. I just want to let people know, they, they, they're they free to ask questions. Free. and. Um, Ellen and I will look at the questions and, you know, if it's like appropriate, we might interrupt you, but otherwise we will we'll hold them to the end, but just absolutely get, people should put them in, uh, you know, as they have their questions. And I, at this point, cannot see the questions right, and I so. want to reorganize things because no, don't I, worry, you don't worry about them. All right. I will not worry about them. So <laughs> I am Jennifer McCrickard. I usually give my students a relatively long spiel about that they can call me anything they want, but then here are the things I will respond to. Most students end up calling me JMC. So that's why it says Professor McCrickard, AKA JMC. And I do have a coaching practice as well where I work with um, college students to make the most out of college. And that's my uh, website there. So just to get us started, let's see here. It will be easier if I, there we go. All right, so I, this one is Ronan. He is my German shepherd who, he is my younger of the two German shepherds. And that's Annie, short for Anakin. And she is the older of my two German shepherds. Just so you get a sense of me, not just as a philosophy professor and somebody who is concerned about young adults doing well in college, but also a dog owner. So just a quick note here. As I was sitting down to think through what to share with you all and what would have um, the, the, what would be the best use of your time, I had way too much to share with you. So this is just gonna be scratching the surface. What I really wanted to focus in on was what sort of information could I give you that you might not get elsewhere? So that's what I'm really trying to focus on. And again, still just scratching the surface. The thing that I want you to be thinking about, and I'm speaking to the students here, so if you're a parent, do the translation, is that what you're working for when you're thinking about college and making your way through college isn't only for your present self. 
It isn't for the just the self of 2023 or 2025 or 2027. You're working on behalf of your future self. So the way that I think about it is I don't want the version of you that's 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in the future to be angry at the version who went to college or annoyed um, with that person. The other thing that I want you to think about is instead of focusing in on what do you want to do immediately after college, to think about preparing for your future career, because your future career won't only be what you're doing immediately after college. And I'm, and I'm going to talk more about this to give you a sense of what to be thinking about as you go to college and how to make the most of it. So the, the four things that I'm going to be hitting on are, this is a time of major transition, what the known unknowns are, and that's generally understanding the general education program at any college or any university, talking a bit about grades and a bit about learning. These are things that are going to be relevant even now before you've gotten to college because much of this is still going to be relevant within the um, high school domain, but it's particularly important to be paying attention to when you get into college. So the one thing that I really want to drive home is this is a significant life transition and for many people going off to college it's the first major life transition and if you've had other life transitions before, this may be the first time that you're going off on your own to do something, to live on your own on a, it, like in a physically different space than your family. So expect that there are going to be hiccups, that this is going to be challenging because you're letting go of who you were and you're reinventing yourself and you're figuring out who you're gonna be and you're having all these experiences and you're just trying to figure out what this next step is. The one way that I think about it, it's like putting on new shoes and you need to get comfortable in those new shoes. Um, but when you're walking around in new, particularly dress shoes, they can be really slippery on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna be sliding around a lot and you're gonna be taking like really weird shuffling steps. All of that is completely normal. But I want, particularly now, when it's pretty far in, in, in the future, just to really be attentive to that and be gentle with yourself because it is a big transition. Um, what's also important to know is that wherever you are gonna be ending up in the fall, your schools know that this is a major transition and they have a huge amount of support for you. They want you to be happy. They want you to be successful. They put a lot of time and a lot of energy into providing support for you. So I really encourage you to take advantage of that. Faculty and staff enjoy working with students. I speak with so many college students who are afraid or not afraid, reluctant to go talk to faculty because they don't wanna bother them. You're not bothering us. One, you're helping us to avoid work that we don't wanna be doing like grading mm -hmm. and we love college students. That's why we're in this business. Very few people become college professors because it's the way they could make the most money. Most of us could do something else and have more money, but we really enjoy this sort of job. We enjoy working with students. So make sure that you take, a, take advantage of the support that your institutions provide. So can I just ask about that, Jennifer? Sweet. When you say support, like what should what should parents like know about or students know about? Like what when they, like what are they looking for when they say support? Is it oh certain, my gosh? Is it a certain dean? Is there an office? You know, there will be a student affairs office. Um, it, it different if it's a college as opposed to a university. There will be different things, but there will be a student affairs office. You will have a dean, but here are the important folks. You'll have an advisor. You'll probably have some sort of first year course where there will be a, a professor who has been, who is guiding you through that first semester, really focusing in on first year students. They may have upperclassmen who are serving as mentors. There will be a counseling center. There will be, um, Academic, uh, academic success folks, if you have 
learning disabilities or anything where you can go and talk to them and they'll help to get you situated. The university is gonna give you a whole lot of information and they're gonna be hammering in on what all the different support is. Um, but those are just some of the key supports. When you move into your residence hall, there will be RAs. There will be, I mean, you're gonna have so many people trying to help you and they'll be at all different levels. So there'll be student, there'll be student services, and then there will be faculty and then there will be administration. Um, but basically everybody's there to make sure you're happy. Um, because at the end of the day, they want you to stay there, be successful, graduate with their name behind you, where the, it says bachelor's degree from whatever school, because you're gonna be walking advertisement for them. And actually Ellen and I um, like harp on that a lot. And that's, oh, okay. I mean, not in a, bad way but I mean that's the business side in exactly. some way you know like yep. these colleges just spent a lot of marketing dollars you know to 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 get the students in and they now need to make sure that they are happy and successful throughout the the four years yes one thing to be to be aware of the really good food that you had when you went to visit campuses yeah that's not an everyday thing they do <laughs> that purposely when prospective students come to visit campus. Um, so just you can adjust what your expectations might be. All right, so a lot of people get to college and the first thing that they're thinking about and because society helps them along this way is how to get out of college. Because so many people, they're asking, what's your major? What are you gonna do after graduation? So you haven't even started yet and people are talking about how to get out. The other thing, so people tend to focus on how that just getting through everything. And when people think about college, they will sometimes believe that it's just this sort of really easy step by step by step process. You start at the bottom, you work your way up all of these steps, then you get to the top, and then you go off the top. And the college hopes that you launch off and you fly and you're fabulous. That's the way that a lot of people think about college. The reality is college is trying to prepare you for life. So it's more like this sort of jungle gym. It's not just steps. It's a bunch of different skills. It's the skills of climbing, the skills of stretching, the skills of working with others. So it's not simply going from one point to another point, but experiencing everything and getting the most out of it that you can. It would be similar to going to a buffet. If if you go to a, let's say it's a really high high class buffet. If you go to a buffet and all you do is eat your favorite food and you ignore everything else, you're missing out. Similarly with college, it's a whole package. So one of the things to keep in mind is that it's been designed to be a whole package and it's helping you if you take advantage of that whole package to be prepared for what comes after college because what comes after college is not simply go from point A to point B. Life has a whole lot of unexpected off ramps, unexpected life changes that college is working to prepare you for. So the idea here is be, be prepared to do something that's out of your, your comfort zone and be prepared to take advantage of all the opportunities, even if they don't obviously connect up with what you think you want to do after college. So one of the things that's really important is to keep in mind that your major isn't the same as your education. Okay? A lot of people get really focused in on, on the major. And a lot of people, some of you may not know what your major is gonna be, and that's completely fine. Don't worry about that. You don't need to know what your major is, just like you don't need to know where you're gonna live for the rest of your life. Your major is one opportunity in your broader education. Okay? It's, it's an opportunity to focus really deeply in an area and come to understand a particular discourse and a particular field, but it's not the, the only way to get the skills that you need to be, to be successful out of college. It helps you to get the skills of how to focus in and how to deeply understand a particular area.
But a lot of students, when they get to college, think major is what's important and nothing else matters. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jennifer, I'm sorry, would you like to comment on like how many times you've seen how are students changing majors? Oh my God. Yeah. Um, so one, so the, let's see, I'm trying to figure out a concise way to put this. First of all, the data shows us like an absurdly high number of, of, of students change, change their majors. I want to say something like 80%. That seems wrong. So it must just be that they like add a major or something. But the idea here is that one, many students think that they want to do something, but it's based on your experiences in, in high school. Um, so you may say, I want to be a history major because you love your history teacher in high school. But then you get to college and you're like, oh, it, it was the person, it wasn't the course. Or you may think that you hate history. And then you take history course in college and you realize that history in college is completely different from history in high school. The other thing is that you haven't experienced all the different disciplines that there are. You haven't experienced all the different opportunities that there are. And you don't know what you might fall in love with. You might not know, you might not know what it is that when you get into it, you're not really gonna enjoy all that much. I went to college, I was pre-med. I was confident that I wanted to be a pediatrician on the research side. Once I got to college and started taking the pre-med track, well, the school that I chose, I went to Wellesley College. I chose it for the purpose of going to med school. I chose this school because it had the highest acceptance rate for women into med school. It didn't occur to me that that might mean that they had a really difficult pre-med program. <laughs> yeah, not the sharpest tool in the shed, but <laughs> totally fine because, but once I got there and I started doing all of these courses, I realized I love science, but I don't love science classes. And I realized that all of the coursework I would have to do before becoming a doctor was something that I wasn't gonna enjoy. And I realized that there were other ways for me to have, it, have an impact on the world. So there, I, I talked to each of my students at the beginning of every semester, each student in each of my courses, and I asked them, what are they planning to do after they, they graduate, if they have any ideas? And that, then they'll tell me and I'll say, well, why that? Whether they're data analytics, going into medicine, going into um, accounting, going into pharmacy, almost all of them say either A, I wanna help people or B, I wanna make a difference. The point here is if either one of those are what you wanna do, so many jobs allow you to do that. So don't get too caught up Lots of people get caught up in what they want their job to be and then choose a major based on that. It makes a lot more sense to find a major that you love and then find a way to make that, to uh, turn that into a career that you'll love. Okay. But in terms of, so what I was saying about majors is um, that's not the only thing. Um, a major gives you a whole lot of information about a particular field right now, okay? If you were a, a computer science major that graduated in 2013, your knowledge, if it hasn't grown since 2013, is gonna be remarkably outdated. We don't know, nobody knows what, your, what the future is gonna look like. We don't know what jobs are gonna be around in five years. Even if we know that certain jobs are gonna be around, we don't know what they're gonna look like because as technology changes, how jobs work also change because there's different innovation. So being a pharmacist today and being a pharmacist 20 years ago, really, really different. So it isn't simply the disciplinary knowledge that you need, but it's all this, this other stuff, okay? So much of what we thought we knew before, we now realize is false. 
I used to work in a, um, or I used to be part of an organization that involved neuroscientists and educators. And it was wonderful to talk to these neuroscientists, some of the top people in, in the field. These are people who are at Princeton, Harvard, you know, all, all the big name schools. And these folks would say that what they had learned when they were in graduate school has now been proven false. So things they were being told were absolutely true in, in, in graduate school, ah, science progresses. Now they know almost none of what they learned was, was actually true. I mean, brain's still in the same location and everything, but I'll bet you can hear my dog. Sorry about that. Dogs are being attended to, sorry about that. Um, so the point is that knowledge is constantly changing. So the content that you get in, in college is important, but what's even more important is, are the skills that you learn, okay? So success long-term is about learning things and learning what to let go of. It's knowing when you don't hold on to what you learned in, in college because that's outdated now. So what's most important moving forward is that you leave college with the skills that we know lead to success. And these skills are not content specific. They're not disciplinary. Uh, they're not specific to any particular discipline because what all colleges are trying to do is make sure that you're successful for the long term. They shouldn't just be working to prepare you for your first job. They should be working to prepare you for your second and your third job, okay? Or your second and your third career. What we know is that people today, people in the future, people change careers. They don't stay in the same career. So you don't want college to just be about those four years and then the five years after it. You want college to be the sort of thing that can carry you and you can continue to draw on as you move through your future, regardless of what that future has in store, a future that you can't begin to accurately predict right now. So general education, this is where general education comes in at your institution. And so what I really wanna do is, is work to get you to take your general education courses seriously, because if you're, Focus in on your major, you're gonna take that seriously because hopefully you enjoy it. But general education is as important, if not more important. So general education is preparing you for the unknown. It's helping you to develop skills that you can transfer. Familiarity with different discourses. One of the things you wanna leave college with is an ability to talk to people who don't have the same education you do whether it's the same disciplinary education or the same institution. You wanna be able to have conversations with all sorts of folks because the ability to communicate, the ability to hear other people, the ability to understand where they're coming from and, and to meet them where they are is an extraordinary skill. And it's one that's difficult to learn if you haven't been working on it. So if you can start working on it in college, that's crucial. And general education helps you to do that because if all you do is get, is you're a specialist in a really narrow field, first of all, you're not going to have distinguished yourself from anybody else who's a specialist in that really narrow field. The other thing is you may be really good in that field, but when it comes to other things, you're not gonna have anything to contribute or any way to talk about it. So becoming familiar with a wide range of disciplines is really important once you leave college. So if you were gonna go talk to people who are interested in, in sports, if you simply loved badminton and you knew everything about badminton, you're gonna be able to talk about badminton with some folks, but if all you know is badminton, you're gonna have nothing else to talk about. 
what you want to do and in that circumstance is be familiar with a whole bunch of sports, not that you're an expert on them, but so you can ask intelligent questions. So you can start to see connections. So you can maintain the connection between yourself and the person who isn't interested in what you're interested in. If you can start to get interested in, in them and form a connection. The other thing about general education is it teaches you all the different ways to see the world. Each discipline gives you a different lens to see the world. So there's a historical way to see the world where everywhere you look, you just see history and you see what was there before. There's a way of looking at the world that's based on physics, really different from the way of looking at the world from history. The more ways you have of seeing the world, the more successful you're gonna be because you're gonna be able to see a whole bunch of different angles and put things into conversation with each other. The people who are most successful are people who are able to draw on different things and put them into conversation, not folks who could only be in one conversation. The other th reason for general education, quite frankly, is there the school is trying to protect their institution's brand. They don't want you going out saying that you graduated from wherever, and then you don't have basic understanding of basic science, math, et cetera. So part of it is that they just want to make sure that if you graduate from college and you're going to have their name attached to you, that you've got enough that you can go out into the world and not embarrass them. Um, they're never going to say that, but that's at least part of it. So general education, these are the sorts of skills that are crucial to long-term success. And these are not skills that you only get in your major. In fact, you, you should be working on all of these skills in all of your classes. When employers were asked what skills they most valued, the number one was asking good questions. I was talking to somebody and what she said was curiosity. That we've got the internet. They don't need workers who have answers. You can find the answers online. You know this, you can Google things, okay? They also don't need people who have answers to all the questions. Again, Google. What they need are people who know how to ask good questions, who, are, who can say, hmm, We've been talking about this for a while, but I feel like we're missing this piece. That ability to say that, to notice what isn't being talked about, to ask a really pointed question that just sort of opens up the conversation, that's crucial. That's the sort of thing that you can't learn by only being in your own discipline because you need to be able to step back from a conversation to look and see how it's going, to be a little bit different from other people who are at the table so that you've got a different vantage point which allows you to have different questions. The other thing that is unbelievably important is learning how to communicate. Um, writing clearly is one of the most important things you can learn in college and many people don't learn it. Um, now there may be a bunch of you who are thinking, oh, I hate writing. Um, well, here's the good news almost everybody hates, hates to write. Now, there might be a few of you who are like, wait a minute, I don't hate, that's great. If you don't hate the write, that's fabulous. I'm so happy for you. Most of the rest of us don't like to write. And the reason we don't like to write is because it's really difficult. You feel like you understand something and then you go to write it down. And it's like trying to describe a dream to somebody. And as you start to describe it, it just seems to dissolve. So you're, you have these ideas, you're trying to write them down, but as you go to write them down, they don't make sense and or they're not as, as brilliant as you thought. So a lot of people give up and they just decide that they're not good writers. Being a good writer takes practice. Everything to do something well takes practice. Learning how to be a good writer is crucial because if you're brilliant and you can't communicate that, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how fabulous your idea is. If you can't get funding because you can't write a good application for a grant, doesn't matter how fabulous that is. Everything, so much of what you, what you want 
you get because you've written out your ideas and you've worked to convince somebody. Being in school is just about the last time where people are going to have to read what you've written, okay? Your faculty are paid to read what you write. Once you leave school, people are gonna stop reading what you write. If it's difficult to understand, if it's uninteresting, if it sounds like everything else. So learning how to write well is one of the most important things you can do. Happily, learning how to write well helps you to learn how to be a better thinker because it helps you to clarify your thinking. In order to write well, you have to think well and vice versa. So all of these things, I'm not gonna go through each of them, that'll take too much time, but all of these skills are skills that general education is working to help you with. Jennifer, I, I just, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say, um, that's See. part of when students are applying to college, and I know we have a lot of seniors probably, but um, the, the personal statement, it's insight into how these students think. And that's what the colleges are trying to um, understand and glean through the students writing. So, right. And, and what they wanna do is help you to develop that. Because once, like I said, once you get out of school, nobody has to read anything that you've written. And so if it's not written well, no one's ever gonna read it. So really take that um, frustration about writing and just recognize it as, yeah, people get frustrated when they're trying to do something well. If you're trying to learn how to play a sport well and you're trying to like be better at it or you're trying to play a musical instrument and you're trying to be better, it takes a lot of work and you feel like you're stupid because you can't quite get it right yet. The way to be successful is to keep on trying, is to take courses that will push you to write, okay? So, but all of these things are crucial. Um, so, and, a, and I'm, one other thing, a lot of those skill sets come about through liberal arts. And absolutely. a lot of people think the liberal arts aren't important and don't have a place in today's society. And I agree, I, I disagree with that. And, um, and I think you're supporting that idea. Absolutely, absolutely. So what you wanna do is develop the capacity for these four things. One, you wanna be able to communicate. Two, you wanna be able to be, be creative, to, to like add new things into conversations. You wanna be a good committee member, which means that you bring something to the table asking good questions and ability to work well with others, all these sorts of things. You wanna be the sort of person who people want to have around and community, that you wanna be able to function in your community in the way that you want to. You want to have as many options as possible. The way that I think about general education is cross-training. So this is where I make the pitch for the humanities, the sciences, social sciences, professional education, cross training. If you look at athletics, you know that if all you do is work on your upper body, you're not gonna be really fit, okay? So this, was a, this is a picture from like the 70s. So I grew up in Southern California near the beach. There's this place called Muscle Beach in Venice. Muscle Beach, when I was growing up, had, had men who looked like this, okay? They were just getting pumped, but all they did was work with their upper body. Their legs were these little spindly things, okay? What we know now is that cross-training is crucial for athletics. No professional athlete doesn't cross-train. No college athlete doesn't cross-train, okay? You see ath athletes from all sports they're doing yoga, they're doing meditation, they're running, they're swimming, they're getting massages, they're lifting weights, they're doing everything. Because cross-training gives you all of these things, flexibility, agility, you know, all of these things, and it's not just happening physically. If you cross-train your mind, you get these mental things as well. What we have down here is, this, is a picture of football players who are doing yoga, okay, because that sort of flexibility is crucial. So when you think about your courses, think about cross-training. How can you, instead of staying in that narrow lane of your specialty, how can you expand it 
to, to demonstrate that you're not just a one trick pony, that you're somebody who is expansive and wants to do that one thing well, but you understand that to do one thing well, you need to be aware of what's going on around you and you need to be able to draw on it when necessary and when it might be helpful. Again, all the people who have like the who have been highly successful, they've taken things from other fields and disparate fields. So they're working in science and they're taking things from politics or they're working in politics and they're taking something from philosophy or they're work, you know, just across disciplinary lines all the time. What you have here is two examples of the high jump. The one in black and white is how they used to do the high jump. Okay, this was how everybody did the high jump. Somebody, however, thinking about it said, you know what, this guy was named Fosbury. He came up with the way of doing the high jump that's in color. It's called the Fosbury flop. He was able to think outside the box, which is a horribly inside the box saying, but he was able to think creatively and do something different. Now you've got to know that he, like when he tried doing this, jumping over the bar differently, it didn't work spectacularly the first time. He had to try it again and again and again until he, he sort of, he had an idea that this was going to work. But it was through trial and error and lots and lots of practice that he was successful. But because he was open to these different ideas, different ways of thinking about things, it made him amenable to thinking about how could this be done better? And so cross training, taking courses from really different disciplines, make a pitch for the humanities. And if you're interested in the humanities, I wanna make a pitch for sciences. I wanna make a pitch for everybody to take the arts that all of these things together feed your mind. It's like having the biggest crayon package you can have. You don't want the crayon package that just has the three crayons. You want the crayon package that has like 128 crayons. The more courses in different disciplines that you take, the more rich your vocabulary will be and the more lenses you'll have to see the world. Jennifer, to uh, piggyback on that, um, a lot of people don't realize that when students apply, if they're, they want to be a doctor and um, when they're applying to medical school, the students that major in the humanities, that major outside of just, you know, they have their pre-med courses, yep. but a lot of students that major in bi biology, chemistry, the ones that major outside of that, maybe in religion, um, Actually, they have music. a higher acceptance rate. Actually, music... The last time I looked, music had the highest acceptance rate into medical school. Now, of course, the reason for this is not that being a music major somehow makes you a really good candidate for going to med school. It's that one, if you wanna to apply to med school, you do all the prerequisites, okay? Two, there are very few people who are music majors and also do all the pre-med credits. Three, music majors are really time intensive. So if you can do a music major and do pre-med, you've demonstrated an extraordinary capacity to manage time. The other thing is going to med school as many careers, it's really important to be able to interact with people. And so being in music, you probably worked a lot with other people. So all of these things, like just doing science, if you're interested in, in med school or dentistry school or something, you're competing against a lot of other people who have probably similar grades, similar internship, similar um, major. When you go to college, you wanna be thinking about one, how do I make myself the sort of person who can succeed under any conditions? I mean, within reason. Um, so what you have here is a picture of a park that's in St. Louis. This is the sort of world you're going to be in, metaphorically. I don't think you're going to be in exactly that world. But you're going to be in a world where you don't know what's going to be going on. That's what you need to prepare for. Okay? And the people who are focusing in on only one thing, they're not going to be able to compete with the folks who have done a whole lot of other stuff. So there's one, there's what do you want for yourself, for your first career, your second career, for things outside of your career, for being part of a community, 
thinking about that, those sorts of things. But then there's also, how do you want to present yourself? How do you want to formulate your resume? And one thing that you want to be able to do is distinguish yourself from all the other people who have the same major and the same GPAs. What makes you different? Not what makes you really good in that particular area, but what's that extra special sauce that you bring to the conversation? Why would somebody want to hire you instead of somebody else who's just as competent, who got really good grades? Jennifer, we have a, a question. I'm please, sorry. please, please. Okay. Oh. Um, how, how do I make sure that I am taking a wide range of classes while also managing my time? Oh, I, excellent question. So here, I will stop sharing for a moment. Let's see here. Um, oh my gosh, lots of questions. Um, let's see. Well, what you're going to do when you get to college is you'll have gen ed requirements and you'll have major requirements. Okay. I've, I had a, another thought, which I'm going to put off to the side and I'm going to remember it. So if I forget it, just give me the word triple major and that'll bring me back. Um, so you're going to have those sets of, of of requirements. So your your major, those you can't really fiddle around with much. Gen ed, you can. So what I'm encouraging you to do is within the courses where you have some choices, really stretch yourself. So at my institution, Drake University, students can get an art credit because we have an art art requirement for taking art history. I took art history to fulfill my art requirement when I was in college. It's wonderful, but if you could do art, like actually get your hands dirty and get paint on them, that's better than just doing something that you're familiar with. I like to read. So art history, and I like history, was really good for me, but it was pretty easy. What I want you to think about is how do you stretch yourself? So within the university system, you'll have all of these different courses that you have to take. So you, what you should probably do is sort of figure out for my major, once you choose one, what courses do I have to be taking? How many courses can I take a semester? And then just sort of map out, what are all of the courses that you now could take um, that are like, what, how many spaces do you have for courses? independent of your major courses. So that's the way that you do that, okay? I also highly recommend study abroad because those sorts of experiences, every single student I've spoken to, they're transformative. So triple major. Many students today appear to believe that the more majors and the more certifications and the more minors that you get, the better. I have seen no evidence to suggest that this is true, okay? So, a, Lots of students will focus in on, you know, being a double major or a triple major with um, two minors and a concentration. Thinking that if you have all of that, it somehow makes you look better. It doesn't necessarily make you look better. It makes you look busier. It might make it, particularly if you're a triple major, it might make it appear that those three majors are not very rigorous. Um, but it doesn't say much about you besides that you were just trying to put a lot of stuff into your bag and be able to say all of these things. I would suggest making sure that you're taking courses that are really meaningful to you, that you that feel like they're stretching you, okay? So it's that getting out of your comfort zone, doing things that are really stretching you. What are some other questions here? We've got a loads of them. Anything else I should hit on or? Should I go back to the presentation? I can't hear you, Debbie. A lot of them were comments oh, okay. um, in the beginning, but there are some more questions that have just popped up. And one of them, Claudine says, what do you say about um, the majors that take a whole lot of time as in 80% of your time, like different sorts of engineering? Yeah, I mean, I would say then that, uh, that if, if you're doing that sort of major, that you then, yeah, then you have like 20% to play around with, okay? so. Take the time that you do have and 
use it in a way that is getting the most, um, the best return for your investment. Okay, I, I try to not use monetary language, but that seems to work here. What you wanna be able to do is demonstrate, yeah, I'm an engineer and I've got all of this training, but you can also see that I've taken a couple courses in English and rhetoric that show that I'm also really good at talking to other people because engineers have a tendency to be really good at talking to other engineers they're less good at talking to non-engineers. My dad was an engineer. I know lots of engineers. They're very close to my heart, but they're not always good at talking to other people. So when you go for an interview to be able to say, I took a bunch of discussion courses that were not in the engineering school, that's going to flag for them. Oh, here's somebody who among other things can talk to people who aren't engineers and who has interests that are not just about engineering. Um, both of those things are gonna be really, really important. Yeah, and also being able to write approachably too. And that's a oh whole skill set for the, for the common person when you're dealing with scientific information. I know so many students who have gotten jobs in fields that they know nothing about, like literally people getting jobs at engineering companies who are English majors simply because they know how to write. Many industries, many companies will say, we can teach you. We can teach you content. What we need are skills. We need people who know how to learn. So the big thing is going to be preparing yourself to be a good learner. And being a good learner means that you're not always going for the A. Because going for an A means you're interested in performing. One of the really weird paradoxes is that if you aim for good grades, you're less likely to get good grades than if you aim at learning. I've been doing a, a lot of work recently on motivation for college students, well, for everybody, but I've been looking at it with regard to college students. And one of the things that the research shows is that even being reminded of grades makes people be less, less creative and less motivated. So do your best to put grades like on the shelf and not think about them very much and, and really work on focusing in on learning. What can I learn? How can I get excited about this? And what's fun is that when you focus in on learning, you'll get higher grades, okay? But doing all of this is what's gonna help you to enjoy college. What were you gonna say? Debbie? Oh, oh, no, I actually just wanted to emphasize what you mentioned earlier about kind of planning out classes or, you know, um, plan, because I, and I'll just from my own personal experience as a mother with kids in college, and one of them was an engineer um, who went to the engineering school. And it's just um, so important because she wanted to take other classes, but, you know, you just have to, yep. um, you know, plan it, you know, from lots of different angles, plan it because you've got to fulfill requirements, plan it because of when certain classes are available, you know, and plan it because of prerequisites. And so I don't think when you start college, you realize how important understanding, you know, um, you, if you could plan honestly, like two years in advance, you know, what you, what classes you hope to, to take, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and someone had another question. Um, could you uh, let me know how tough it, the honors program is and advantages of doing it, which is great. And I also want to remind you, triple major, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I think I covered the triple major piece. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> honors, it, it really, it depends on the institution. I would say what, what you want more than anything. So being part of an honors program gives you that designation. So if you're in an honors, if you're a philosophy major, if you're a physics major, those sorts of things are gonna stand out to people and for better or worse, they're gonna say, ooh, they're really smart. Um, so that's the one reason to be part of an honors program. But the other reason to be part of an honors program is that honors courses, um, regardless of how the courses are actually taught, you're surrounded by other honors students and one of the best things 
to becoming a good learner is to be part of a community of good learners. So the way that people become partiers is they hang out with a bunch of people who party, okay? The way to become a good learner is to hang out with people who are good learners. You can do the same, you can do both. You could be a, you could be a partier and a good learner at the same time, I hear. Um, so, <laughs> but what you wanna do is, so in an honors program, that's what you're going to get is you're going to be around other people who take learning seriously. What you want, I would say, in terms of quality education is you want small classes where you are able to take risks in talking, sharing ideas, um, all of which you do without very, very lightly. So one of the things that I see is students particularly in their first year, because they're so nervous, they will tend to be very, very quiet in classes. That's understandable because you don't want to look stupid. The problem is that you're squandering an opportunity. You're letting the fear get in the way of the learning. Okay, So courses to look for are courses where there's a small, small enough classroom where there can be discussion and a classroom where you feel safe enough in terms of um, comfort, that there's camaraderie, that there's general respect. It doesn't mean that everybody's holding hands and singing Kumbaya or agreeing with everybody all the time. That's the last thing you want, but that there's a, there's a level of respect where you can talk to each other. And I really encourage you to take those risks of sharing ideas that you're not certain of because that's what college is about. It's about playing around with ideas. Um, if we had gotten to the end of my PowerPoint, which, we, which I knew we weren't gonna get to, there's a picture of somebody rock climbing because I think that just so captures what, what a good college experience is, metaphorically. It's about stretching. If, you, if you've ever gone rock climbing, it, it, it looks deceptively easy. You're like, how hard could it be? P particularly if you go to a, like, a, like a climbing gym, they've got everything color coded. It's right there, it's super easy, but it isn't. You find yourself trapped like six inches above the ground, standing on something that's really comfortable to stand on. And you're trying to reach for something that you can barely hold on to, but you try it. And that's what learning how to rock climb is about. It's about learning how to stretch. It's about saying, okay, I'm on this really comfortable ledge now, but the only way I can get to that next level is by standing on something that's less comfortable. So I'm going to try that and I'm going to see how that works. And so it's about this, it's about stretching and it's about a lot of falling, but your faculty are there, your whole institution is there to help you when you fall to figure out why you fell and to help you get up again and try it again. So when you're in classes, try things, try out new ideas. And you don't have to say, by God, I believe this. You say, you know, I'm kind of toying with the idea that maybe da -da 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 -da. And I'm thinking this possibly because, so you can hedge it a lot. So, because I know that a lot of times students don't like to talk in class because they're afraid that they're gonna to have to defend something to the death or they're afraid that they're gonna be judged. But if you bring it up in a way where you demonstrate that you're holding it lightly and you're just sort of ruminating, you're like, I'm sort of thinking about this, but maybe not, I don't know. Um, that opens up conversation. I had a student last year in my first year seminar, we read, um, I gave the students choices of books and this, this young man chose to read um, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Afterward, we're talking in my office and he says, you know, JMC he said, that book was so interesting. It's got me thinking about Islam. Wonder if I might want to convert to Islam. He said, I'm going to read some more about Islam. I was like, great, you go do that, Caleb. You go learn more about Islam. But it's this, it's, he was holding it lightly. He was like, this is fascinating. I want to learn more about it. So think about that when you're in college that to take advantage of every moment is to be willing to stretch yourself, not stretch yourself so much that you have a panic attack, please don't do that, but you don't wanna to be too much in your, in your comfort zone. 
you want to be a little bit, they call it within education, the proximal zone of, oh, there's a word there I just lost. Um, but it's about that learning zone that's just a little bit out of reach. It's like when you're teaching a, a baby how to walk, they can make a few steps and you sort of hold your hands there for them but you don't quite touch them. You hold your hand just in case they, and then you're like, oh, or they fall and you go, uh oh, that, I mean, that's what you're doing is you're, you're learning these new things um, and you're supposed to make mistakes. And if you sit around worrying and all you do is focus on, on avoiding mistakes, you're not gonna do very well. This is another thing. And parents, I really want you to pay attention to this. If you're getting a 4.0, this might be evidence that you're not learning very much. Because the easiest way, usually I would, this would be a call and response thing where I would ask you all, what's the easiest way to get a high GPA? Somebody write that in the chat. What's the easiest way to get a high GPA? Oh, that's a good question, Adrian. Nobody knows the highest way, the easiest way to get a high GPA. Yes, take easy classes, <laughs> nicely done. <laughs> Taking easy classes is the easiest way. Yes, take classes you're already good at. So if all you focus on is getting good grades, and that's all anybody ever talks about is getting good grades, that's super easily done. It's really easy to get good grades. You just take classes that you know you, that you don't have to do any work in. You find the classes that are easy. I had a student once, one of my favorite students, ended up majoring or minoring in philosophy. And, and she said, she said, Professor McCricker, she said, your classes are so difficult for me. They're so challenging. They just like mess with my head. So, but I love them and I love learning them. And I only get B's in your classes, but I keep taking them because I feel like I grow so much. That person got a better reference letter from me than the person who took my logic class who was a computer science major, who basically my logic class is just a computer science class. So he took it to get an easy A. So he got an A, but he's not gonna get a very good letter from me. The student who was getting Bs, but was doing it because it was really pushing her, she's gonna get a good reference letter. So getting good grades is not necessarily good evidence that you're getting the most out of college. Getting a well-earned B or even a well-earned C can mean that you're actually learning a lot more, okay? Um, there was a question about, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff on focusing on grades. Uh, yeah, cool stuff. Thank you, Julie. Um, somebody asked about increasing polarization. Different institutions address it differently. Um, what I would in encourage, students tend to be, because they're all living together, pretty good at having these sorts of conversations in the residence halls. It becomes more challenging in the classroom, um, particularly if the students believe that the, that the faculty member wants to hear a certain sort of answer, um, which we almost never do, but that's the challenge. So yes, it, colleges and universities really want students to be having conversations across party lines, so to speak, but um, it can be difficult in a classroom where there's a lot of people who seem to hold one view and another and the minority of students disagree. Um, so part of that is just finding your people, finding not finding your people who agree with you, because I'm trained as an ethicist and we know that that's not a good thing to do, but finding people who are interested in exploring ideas, who know that people change their mind, who know that as humans we're fallible. And so the current beliefs that I have could be completely wrong and I want somebody else to help me think them through. Um, other questions? I can't hear you, Ellen. I was multitasking, sorry. There um, there's one about large classes in, um, in big universities and how to deal with those ah. challenges. Okay, really good question. So one of the, there's research that's been done. So see a couple things. One, go to classes. 
particularly when there are large classes, it becomes much easier to not go to class because the professor might not notice. Go anyway and take notes. Take notes by hand. Don't just take the PowerPoint that the professor emails to you because one, that may not have everything. And two, you may download it and then never look at it again, or you may look at it, but you're not really learning from it. You learn a lot more when you're taking notes. So I would say one, go to class, take notes. Two, find other people in the class to work with. Um, they did some interesting research and I don't have the, the citation, but it was looking at the question of why did international students seem to be doing better in college than non-international students or uh, domestic students. And when they looked at students who had really similar GPAs and they, they seemed to come in with the same qualification, but the international students were still doing better. One of the things that they learned is that many places, either they house all the international students together or just because international students want to be with people who make them feel comfortable, they spend time with other international students. International students were studying together and they were helping each other to learn. Even if they weren't in the same classes, they were still studying together. They would ask each other questions, they would quiz each other, but they were working together. US students have a tendency to work independently and to believe that I need to do it myself or else it isn't really me. Now, of course, I'm, I'm not saying plagiarize, no, um, but I'm saying that working together, having a study group can be, is really, really helpful because you help people who don't understand things and you do. When you're helping somebody understand stuff, you learn it better. And you get have other people explain things to you if they understand it better. And then you can ask them questions. And because they're peers, you may feel more comfortable saying, well, I got this part, but tell me this again. So maybe easier that. So in terms of classes, great big classes don't have to be a problem. Work with your, um, find a study group. Usually large classes do have breakout groups, whether it's a um, lab or a once a week um, section meeting where you'll ha have a, a grad student or a lab instructor really take, take advantage of that. And then of course, take advantage of office hours to go talk to, talk to faculty. What else can I help you all with? I think we're up to date on questions. I was going to ask you, I, I don't want to use the word mistake because we, we don't want to, you know, we want to encourage mistakes, so to speak, because people learn. But what's the most common misstep, perhaps, that you see students um, oh. make? Trying to figure out a way, a nice way, a nice way to put this. Um, I, there's, there's so many common mistakes, but the one that comes to mind is students who come to college and carry with them the air, A-I-R, of they know everything already. They know how the class is supposed to, and, and just sort of generally being resistant to anything new. So that, so yeah, so if I were to generalize it, is people being just wanting to be comfortable. So if a, if a professor asks them to do something that they're not used to doing, then they just they just reject it, or they're asked, you know. So that people who are resistant to going outside of their comfort zone. The other thing is, and and this is a common problem. So it's I I, I wouldn't call it a misstep, but it's a very common trend. Something just to be attentive to is getting so wrapped up in the social piece of college that the academic piece falls away. Um, what can be really helpful is to have a planner, either a physical like book planner or on your phone where you start to plan your whole day. And I would strongly suggest having a day where you leave in the morning and you come back in the evening. 
And so you write down where you're going. So you make it to all your classes. You will all probably do that. Most of you will do that. Um, but then also put in your planner from, you know, if, if you have class from say nine to 1030, then you say, all right, from 1030 to noon, I'm going to go and I'm going to sit in the library and I'm going to work on this, you know, every single Monday at this time in this place, I'm going to be doing this homework. So you start to really organize yourself because a couple things happen. One, students go from high school to college and high school is so, so structured. You know where you're supposed to be at any given moment in the day. Everybody's making sure that you're turning everything in. Your, your family structure is probably such that you are like, somebody knows where you are at all at all times. You get to college and all of a sudden you're taking, you know, three, four, five classes spread out throughout the week and you've got a whole lot of unscheduled time in there. An unscheduled time for a, for a first year student turns into lots and lots of social time. The problem with that isn't that socializing is bad. It's a really good thing and you need to make connections, you need support. It's that you start to prioritize that and you start thinking, well, I can do the reading later. I can write the paper later. I can do this later. And you start putting everything off and then it becomes overwhelming. And then you feel like you can't do anything. Um, and so then you just give up on it. So I would suggest one, that you really map out what you're gonna be doing, like when you're gonna be studying what and where. So you've got a schedule to adhere to. The other thing is that if you have an assignment, focus in on getting shitty drafts done. Like get, um, this is Annie Lamott's language. And she says, you know, the, what you wanna do is you have your first shitty draft. And if you get a paper assignment, go home that day and write the first shitty draft. And just like spend maybe half an hour on it. That way you've got something that you can then go back to because rewriting is so much easier than writing. So the time management piece is big um, and doing only that which is comfortable. Sorry, I'm trying to cram so much in because there's so much to know. No, that's, a, that's great advice in that. Yeah. yeah. Love in Lamont and, and, yes. her, uh, and her colorful language. Yes, yes. <laughs> Anything else I can help you all with? So how do you work with students? You know, I mean, you know, like coaching students. Coaching students. So, so I typically work on Zoom with them um, and we meet once every other week. And it's me helping students to be, it's me working to be a sort of in between living at home in high school with a lot of people supervising to being on your own. And I act as this sort of, as a competent adult who knows a lot about higher education, who doesn't have an emotional investment in you becoming what you said you wanted to be when you were six years old, um, and really helping students to develop their own agency in terms of talking through what are the current things that you're struggling with, where do you want to be, what are the obstacles, and just sort of helping students work it through. I very rarely tell students what to do because my goals for my life are really different than the students' goals for their lives. So I'm really helping students to think through what is it that makes the most sense for them. So just to have us have a quiet space so we can, so I, and we just sit down and we talk and then they come up with some, some strategies about what they wanna be working on. They work on it and we check in two weeks later. It's wonderful work. I enjoy doing it and I've discovered that the work that I did as a philosophy professor and helping people think about how should you live your life generally really transitions well into being a coach and helping students through what it is they want to be getting out of college and how to avoid some of the missteps, whether that's missteps of procrastination, perfectionism, um, not being able to talk in class, or just wanting to up your game a bit. Yeah. And you work with like students in at any year? Any year, absolutely, any year. Yeah, I love, I, yeah, anybody, any, anybody, anytime, 
Yeah. And if you want to reach out to me, my, um, let's see, I, here is my, let's see, jmccoaching.net is my website, which is not a fancy website because I just put it together last night because I, <laughs> Mostly I've been working with uh, Drake students and so, or just word of mouth students. So I was like, Ooh, I probably need a website. So it's not the snazziest website in the world, but it gives you the relevant information. And here's my email address too, if you want to just email me. There we go. Great. Yeah. Well, Sorry, I didn't have more time to, to share more with you. If you all have any questions, please feel free to reach out. No, thank you, Jennifer. I mean, um, I hope that people found that helpful. I think, you know, what you had mentioned earlier, I, um, again, before we started was this um, idea that it's it's good to hear this information now, we're in April, you know, as opposed to, I mean, it's still valuable to hear it in July or August, but you're kind of, the parent and the student are like at the height of, of, yes, trend, yes. of trying to, you right. know, Anxiety start. is in full force now. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So Absolutely. this is this can give people like a little time for some of the information to sink in, you know, and maybe, you know, as they get closer, they might think more about how to use some of the information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thank you all for the time. I really appreciate it. And good luck as you move forward. This is a really exciting time and I hope you have fun with it. Yeah. Great. I oh, I hear these types of talks. I always feel like I want to go back to school. We do yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank All you, right. everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Absolutely. Ellen. Take See care. Bye-bye.